Hello, welcome again to our first uh, meeting this particular month. It is um, by gratitude that we should acknowledge that God has given us life. He has kept us despite the challenges of life and has kept us going. Uh, at the same time, we have um, commissioned a survey that we hope that this month or early next month we, we are going to put together um, a program or some avenue that we can have solution for our uh, brothers and sisters who may have had challenges um, through the effects of coronavirus. All throughout this month and going forward, we are going to have different streams of discussions or lectures and we are going to continue on our africa lecture series we are going to go into some kind of business and career lecture series and then we'll continue with our gilgal series and then we would add some new programs to it including making time to intercede and to pray for africa together and we invite you always to not just connect uh, with us through the videos on YouTube, but to get closer because together we would be able, by God's grace, to see Africa's advancement in our lifetime. We thank God for this opportunity and this privilege. And today we want to hold an Africa lecture series called Straight Lines and Circles. Oh. Um, oh, circles and straight lines, whichever way you want to put it. This is going to be a, a couple of series that will hold each month along this line, but we don't want to stuff all into one month, so we'll be varying uh, as the period goes on. And we are doing all this because we want to leave our three core principles of inter uh, identify, inter intervene and intercede or intercede and intervene identify intercede intervene by identify we try to know which areas or which aspects of life for africa within africa that requires us to know and to put in the effort by intercede we actually go on our knees and we pray for the people we pray for the continent and by intervening, we come up with programs like I talked about. We are starting with the survey and then to find also practical solutions to the challenges of Africans and Africa all throughout. And we do this because it's important that we know where Africa has come from, why it is where it is and where it's heading towards. And that is why today we hold one of our lecture series which we have a couple of them uh, on youtube you can check them out we talked about slavery a new perspective we talked about movers and shapers of africa and way back in africa christianity in africa we've had a couple of lectures last year you can find them on youtube but today let us get on with our uh, lecture for today called as i mentioned uh, straight lines and circles or circles and straight lines what is it about it's really about how the european took over africa how they managed it how come they succeeded and what we need to learn from it as you would see on my shoulder side here at the end of the 19th century, that picture is showing you, is depicting the Berlin Conference. You know, at the end of the 19th century, the Europeans had discovered Africa and therefore they had tasted a bit of it and somehow decided that they must evenly share the continent of Africa among themselves. And so, 
uh, right from the 15th of November 19, uh, 1884, sorry, 1884, uh, all throughout to February 26, 1885, there were a series of negotiations and the chief marketplace was Berlin, Germany. But also, there were some of them that took place in London, in Paris, in, in, in um, other capitals, I believe, like Brussels and the likes. The bargain went on. What was the background of this bargain among the European powers? They obviously had very limited knowledge of the land that they were sharing and its people and its culture and all of that they have extremely limited knowledge why because they had hitherto at this point been only aware of a few coastal areas in africa where they went they did trade with a few people along the coast especially in the hinterlands there was almost no knowledge by the europeans but then they still were determined to share africa it was actually only in algeria and the southern part of africa that they were really notable European settlements there. But outside that, not much. And, and therefore, the tools they use for these negotiations and, and, and sharing of the land and the people of Africa was really extremely inaccurate maps. Large areas were therefore described at that time as terra incognita. Terra incognita. What does it mean? It means unknown land. Despite this terminology for most part of the land on the maps, in accurate maps they were using, they went ahead and they marked through the land mainly using circles and straight lines. Straight lines and circles to determine which part goes to who, which part goes to uh, which nation. And that is where the, the title of this lecture is derived from. They drew these straight lines and circles through the maps. They ignored it, therefore, in the process, the traditional monarchies, the chiefdoms, the societies on the ground, and they mainly made geographical lines of latitudes and longitudes. And as they continue this way, we, we will notice that most of the sharing had absolutely no implication and uh, no uh, understanding of the people and therefore the implication for africans was not taken into consideration where the europeans met they did not really factor in the interests of the africans so uh, at the end of this what was the impact of this kind of sharing of africa on the islam so they, they, they devised new boundaries, as I said, they cut through, therefore, around 190 cultural groups and enclosed several cultures and histories and languages and religions all together in one or separated some of them. And so let's go through some examples of this so that it is tangible to us as we go through this lecture. For instance, the Bakongos were partitioned between the French uh, uh, between the French Congo, the Belgium Congo, and the Portuguese Angola. One group of people, a uh, totally separated. The Somali land was carved between the British, the Italians, and the French at the eastern side of Africa. And you notice also that they formed some nations like Nigeria, which therefore now contained 250 ethno-linguistic groups. Officials sent to Belgium, Congo, eventually identified 6,000 chiefdoms there, 6,000 chiefdoms in the Belgium, Congo alone. In the Belgium, Congo alone. And some actually survived intact, some cultural groups, some some. Uh, Chitom, some clans survived intact. A few of them were in Morocco and Tunisia where the monarchy survived. And therefore you see that one of the strongest monarchies in Africa till today is that of Morocco. It's because 
they were left intact by the French at that time. The British ruled Egypt, for instance, in the name of a dynasty of foreign monarchs founded in 1811 by an Albanian uh, mercenary who was serving in the Turkish army at that time. We did a lecture about him. He's called Mohammed Ali Pasha, one of the men who have had the greatest impact on Africa in the years past, even to this day. And the, the British left them kind of uh, the monarchy to continue to rule. So Egypt was somehow also kept intact. However, some were merged, as in they took a group of people and they pushed they and merged them with others, making a bigger. So in itself, the core group was not uh, necessarily separated, but then they made it bigger. For instance, is the Ashantis in the Gold Coast or present-day Ghana and Low Zealand in the northern Rhodesia at that time or present-day Zambia. They were merged into larger colonial units. Um, also, there were antagonistic kingdoms that were forced together. Some kingdoms that really had challenges already were forced to be together because the Europeans are determined already at that time that they wanted to have those land together and therefore the people did not matter. For instance, the Buganda and the Bunyoro in Uganda, present day Uganda, they were linked into the same colony. In the Sahel, for instance, you have the new territories that were being established across the great divide between the desert region of Sahara and the belt of tropical forests to the south sudan is typical you had and and only recently that you have had a separation of the sudan but the southern christian more or less close to the tropical land were, were forced to merge with the northern islamic land into one nation also is um, the chad and nigeria where the northern muslims were merged with the southern Christian communities. And this throwing therefore together, as I said, the Muslim and non-Muslim people in latent hostilities, which till today is not effectively dealt with. So we notice that lands and people became little for more than pieces. Or, or I want to say that lands and people became very little more than pieces of, 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 of uh, kind of tools, uh, game tools, for instance, on a chess game, where they just move them around. That is how they share the land up without any meticulous concern of the people and how they lived and how they should live together. So that already affected the fabric of the African society. And it's important we understand this. That the nations we see today were not because we were always together. And therefore, all these challenges, the conflicts that arose from there, all the dangerous fights now, even to today, elections are going on and people see themselves separate because they were not necessarily agreeing to live together. They were forced to live together. And a typical illustration of this, perhaps you could read it behind me here. But Lord Salisbury, of the uh, who was a British Prime Minister at that time in London, said this. He says, "We have been giving away mountains and rivers and lakes to each other, only hindered by the small impediment that we never knew exactly." where they were and he called it small impediment to say small impediment that they were never aware of where all the stuff that they were sharing were actually located the british traded for instance the north sea island of heligoland with the germans for zanzibar Parts of the northern Nigeria with the French well, was exchanged with the French for city, uh, fishing rights in the Newfoundland. 
The French, on the other hand, exchanged at the meeting, yeah, at the negotiations. Now, they exchanged parts of Cameroon with Germany in return for German recognition of the French protectorate over Morocco. For instance. And by the time that the scramble of Africa was over, some 10,000 African politics or kind of groups, small groupings, had been amalgamated into 40 European colonies and protectorates. And that is what you see in the map here. This is how Africa looked shortly after they had shared the land. Almost no much of too many nations within. And therefore it is important to understand that when this had taken place, how did they enforce their um, agreements? How was it enforced and how did it become effective? What was the way that people responded to this straight lines and circles way of dividing the people up. Basically, the Europeans enforced their agreements and, uh, and their um, booties by either treaty or conquest. Either you, 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 you give up and accept what they are doing or they will conquer you and defeat you. So from their enclaves on the coast, officials set up to go much into the hinterlands to discover what they have already shared. And the French, for instance, made claims extending over 3 uh, million and uh, 3.75 million square miles over the land. And the British approximately 2 million square miles over Africa. And they needed, therefore, to go in and make sure that all these were truly in their grips or in their hand. So some leaders of Africa actually appealed. This was one of the responses that you find over the continent. Some appealed. For instance, the Batsuto king, Mushosho, in southern Africa, followed by some of his neighbors, um, the Tswana chiefdom, of the uh, Bukwana land, present day Botswana, and the Swazi appealed for the protect uh, for the protection of Queen Victoria, the British Queen at that time, imploring that his people might be considered even as flies or fleas in the Queen's blanket. Just to see how petty they were and to leave them alone. This was the kind of appeal that some of the chiefs had to send. That their people will not be taken over and be treated as pieces of material by the Europeans. There was widespread and different degrees of resistances also, in addition to some of these uh, appeals that were made. And some resulted, uh, so for instance, some leaders died in the process, others were executed, and uh, others were actually sent to exile. How do we see this? For instance, the Muslim emirs of the Sokoto Caliphate, ruling from the red clay palaces, on the edge of the Sahara Desert soon came to terms with a small British expeditionary force sent to incorporate them into northern Nigeria. And they allowed them after a little bit, just not so much of resistance. The Asante Kingdom in Ghana, or Gold Coast at that time, they actually besieged the British in Kumasi, the capital of Ashanti, today also for four continuous months until the British received reinforcement before they could break the resistance of the Asantes, where they then made them, uh, emerged them as part of a bigger colony that formed the Gold Coast at that time. Still in West Africa, the Turi, the founder of the Mandingo Empire, 
uh, Samori Touré. He waged an eight good year war against the French. In Rhodesia or present day Zimbabwe, the Indebele and Shona fought ferociously against white settlers who had seized large areas of their land. In Kenya, the Nandi faced six destructive expeditions of the British force. And elsewhere, over three-fourths of the Herero people and half of the Nama people between 1904 and 1908, that is four-year period, were extinguished by the German administration in German East Africa, which was called Tajaninka or Tajanika, Tajanika, which is present-day Tanzania, and the Southwest Africa, Southwest Africa, which is present-day Namibia. Massive brutalities to force the straight lines and circles they have drawn back in Berlin and other places. In Angola, Chief Mandami of the Ovambo marshaled an army of about 40,000 troops to defy the Portuguese. At this time, the British were at the height of their global powers. They tried to use this kind of force and power in Africa. Hence, they set out to take over two independent Boer republics. That is the Transvaal and the Orange Free State in Southern Africa. Unexpected to the British, this generated into a three-year-long war requiring 500,000 imperial troops to finish it off, to finish the battle off, leaving a long-standing legacy of bitterness and hatred among the Africaners that has endured to this day. So when you see so much hatred in South Africa, it didn't begin today. The seeds were sown long ago was so long ago. The Boale of Cote d'Ivoire also fought the French village by village until 1911. The Igbos of Nigeria were only fully defeated in 1919. Took such a long time of resistance. The Jola of Senegal were not fully defeated until 1920. The Dinka of Southern Sudan were not fully defeated until 1927. A fiery Muslim sheikh, Mohammed Abdil Hassan, named by his European opponents as Mad Mullah, led a devish warrior in a holy war against the British for 20 good years until his death in 1920. The Bedouins in Libya resisted the Italians for nine years in guerrilla warfare ending in 1931. And so you would see that there were various degrees of resistances that actually persisted all throughout the period. But by the 1930s, however, the colonial masters had entreated, entrenched their rule and obtained legitimacy in the eyes of the people. But the story would not remain so forever. And we must know why. And that is very crucial to note in the next session. Events in the First World War actually impacted the European project in Africa. And you notice that in the First World War, there was a significant um, victory for the British and their allies, like the French and all of that. And what happened is that after the First World War, the German colonies, particularly of Togoland and Cameroon, were shared among the British and the French. So today, French speaking Togo is still in existence, and French speaking Cameroon is still in existence. Rwanda and Burundi passed to the Belgium, Italy 
for supporting the bed uh, for supporting the, the war was given by the British Jubaland to form part of the Italian Somaliland, moving the border of Kenya a little bit westward. And this was the change. And actually, it is only Ethiopia at this stage that had not been fully impacted by the war at that time. It's only Ethiopia that was not uh, fully impacted by the war at that time. And you will notice that despite this scenario, Benito Mussolini would years later invade Addis Ababa, take over the city, drive out Haile Selassie, and then um, rule for a short period of time until there is a return due to the Second World War. But it is only this Asian Christian kingdom that was not overridden by the European activity in Berlin and other places, drawing cycles and straight lines through Africa. How did they navigate the colonial era? Because it is important to understand the European powers seem to soon actually lose interest. They seem to soon lose interest. And you will notice that they had not actually intended to make the territories of Africa their business to develop it. And therefore, they did not put in so many people and they did not put in so many resources but they had intended that Africa will be self-financing and self-sustaining in itself it is important to see that the Europeans also expected to actually have this piece of property for a very long time for a very long time and how did they therefore manage it in terms of their administration and the rule they sent a couple of people there mainly as administrators and these people became known in the french africa circles as roy de la brose meaning kings of the bush kings of the bush and it meant that they were in one part judges, they were in one part the police commissioner, they were the task collectors and all of that, that they held so much authority on the ground. And this was one of the reasons why Africa has become what it is, because there's been so much depth of, of, of brutality, lack of, 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 of uh, collective thinking, even at the time of the colonial masters. And by way of governance, they limited it to maintaining only law and order, raising taxes and providing a few infrastructures here and there to keep going. And in, in enforcing administration, they kept to this to a very minimum among themselves and adopted indirect rule. And this line of control, control actually existed in a very thin way. By the 1930s, less than 400 Europeans controlled over 20 million African Nigerians at that time, following the union of Southern and Northern Nigeria. So you have 400 Europeans controlling 200, uh, 20 million Africans. Such thing was it. And this was successful because the likes of Lugard had implemented, uh, devised the indirect rule. The whole British tropical Africa which had 43 million people at that time were managed by 1,200 administrators alone. They relied therefore heavily on the chiefs, the African chiefs and other functionaries over time. As I said, Luga devised this indirect rule in Northern Nigeria. And for instance, he allowed the Fulanese to rule the, 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 themselves, continuing to rule by the Islamic um, um, principles, but then the court systems and a few of these critical 
uh, sectors were managed by the British and they used their chiefs to continue to rule in as much as they would cooperate with them. This unfortunately led to the corruption of chieftaincy in Africa. Where chiefs were non-existent, they actually went on and they installed chiefs. For instance, in the Asifalos villages of, of uh, or village societies of southern Nigeria, of the Igbos at that time, chiefs were paid to transmit. Uh, I'm sorry, they actually installed chiefs where they, they didn't have some chiefs existing at that time. Where they did not have among some of the Igbo tribes at that time, the British worked with them to install for themselves a chief. And when they did that, they made sure that it is the people who would collaborate and cooperate with them who would become chiefs eventually. And they would be used, therefore, to transmit government orders to the people. So you see that immediately they went to the top of the society, they made them comfortable, and therefore they could manage all these people. Africa today somehow is being managed by a few educated class Many of them are living comfortably and controlling the people without the people actually actively participating in the governance and administrating administration of them. In fact, many do not even understand and do not have the, the, the mind to understand because they, they, they need to meet their daily needs. There was no intent for rapid development, as I said. They never intended to build Africa for us. They came to rule and to have the best of it but not to develop it for us. Economically, what did they do? They left all the activities in a handful of a few commercial companies. And therefore, new patterns began. For instance, new large-scale ag commercial agriculture or, or came about, and then heavy mining activities also came about. You would see that there was significant on the negative side, significant export of, of raw materials in terms of minerals and agriculture in particular. Commodities, for instance, granite, palm oil, cotton, coffee, cocoa, and sisal became extensively exported. The concept of export did not begin well with Africa. And by 1911, Gold Coast at that time, or present-day Ghana, already became the world leading exporter of cocoa in its raw state. This is how the modern African nation was brought up. And somehow we have never recovered from exporting in large quantities our resources. Europeans took rich farmlands for their exclusive use, particularly in Algeria and also in Tunisia. Look, in 1931, half of the entire land area of southern Rhodesia, or present-day Zimbabwe, was stipulated for the use of the white farmer. And this was around, then these people were around 2,500 alone, and that a significant portion of the farmlands were attributed to them. This is this was the, the, the initiation of the, the or the beginning of the battle of the likes of Robert Mugabe, who in recent years decided to take the farmlands from the white people and had extensive challenges with the Europeans. In South Africa, some eighty-seven percent of the total land area were actually declared white land. Again, beginning this apartheid system that endured until 1994. Such a long time. In terms of education, how did they enforce these circles and straight lines? They placed them in the hands of few Christian missionaries. And by 1910, 16,000 European missionaries were stationed in Africa. 16,000, quite a number, but for the population, not so much. First secondary schools were therefore established in places like Ghana, Senegal, Uganda, Nigeria, South Africa, and Egypt. And 
Out of this, they produce a new educated elite. In the 1920s and 30s, we are talking about. And these educated elites, they began to gain more administrative positions. And therefore, they began to be competitors to the chiefs. So the chieftaincy in Africa were corrupted from the beginning. And at this time, they had local educated elites to compete for admin positions and over the chiefs. And also they were more interested in seeking status and to gain for themselves some kind of attention from the white man. And they paid little or no attention to the plight or the welfare of the rural masses. In 1936, Ferhat Abbas, who studied pharmacology at Algiers University, said, and this is a very sad one, and I quote it to you. He said, I have had discovered, if I have discovered an Algeria nation, I would be a nationalist, and I would not blush for it as though it were a crime. Men who die for a patriotic ideal are daily honored and regarded. My life is worth no more than theirs. Yet I will not die for the Algerian homeland because such a homeland does not exist. I have asked the living and the dead. I have visited the cemeteries. No one has told me of it. No one. They say one does not build on the way. This is how sad some of the educated elites thought. And many were actually so philosophical in their way of thinking and way of doing things to the extent that they have actually lost touch with the masses and reality. Do we have such educated elites today who have consciously or unconsciously become a tool against their own people? It's not so much for who they are for, but it is the, the most important part is who they are not working for or living to support and that they lost track of the masses. They saw themselves as supreme, having wisdom that the masses did not have. So, in bringing all this together, what are the lessons we want to learn from the circles and straight lines that were drawn to bring up the modern day Africa? One, it is important that we understand that the European or the foreigner never set off to build Africa. They set off to divide the land for their benefit. It is somehow logical that every people seek their own interest. Unless we go beyond our selfish human nature, it is almost impractical to seek the interests of another over our own or adjacent our own. So it was a reality that since time in, from the beginning, when the modern states of Africa were formed, there was no agenda or objective to develop the land or the nation of Africa and its people. Therefore, the lesson here is that Africans must take it up upon ourselves that the development or the advancement of the people in the nation are dependent upon us. And the earlier we rose up to commit to this in our individual capacity, the better. Two, we must plan our contribution. There's a saying that what gets planned gets executed or gets done or gets achieved. The Europeans 
went through a series of negotiations, particularly in Berlin, for a long period of time to agree on how to scramble and divide up Africa land. They planned it and they worked it out. If we don't actively plan our own contribution to the land and its advancement, it will not work. We will not wake up a day and see Africa advance. Just like the Algerian <laughs> um, elite, as we mentioned earlier, Fehat Abbas mentioned, he says he didn't find any Algeria and therefore he couldn't die for one. We must plan for our own Sudan, our own Mauritania, our own Ethiopia, our own South Africa, Ghana, Nigeria, our own Chad. We must plan for our own Congo, our own Zambia, and execute it out. Because what gets planned gets done. And practically plan your own contribution. Don't just desire it but plan it. How will you contribute to it? Individually and if in a collective, why not? But we are not going to wait. The third is, lesson is that our chiefs lost focus when the pressure was intense. Some resisted but only to the extent they could. It is a testament that it is not going to be a nine day wonder, neither will it be on a silver platter to see Africa transformed. There will be intense opposition. It is only for those who are ready who would be able to greatly contribute to this effort. That focus and tenacity and resolve that our lives must count for the people and the nation must be deep rooted because that will be proven when the challenge comes. And this is why many people cannot go beyond their personal needs and think about some of these topics because they are totally engrossed in themselves how to go for it, how to get a land, how to get a house, how to get a car, how to get this, how to get that. Yes, those things are important. But they in themselves will not bring us and our people the victory and advancement that we desire. And therefore, we must resolve and remain resolute. Number four lesson. We learned that there was barely enough Africans ready to collaborate against the Europeans. But when the Europeans enticed the chiefs and the elite, they collaborated with them, even, even when it was against their own people. Without unity, we stand no chance. Therefore, let us pay particular attention to loving our fellow Africans, to contributing to their development, their advancement, and to, to show forth unity at every level. If you are in Africa, show forth unity with your, your, your fellow national, with your brother, your sister, your neighbor, show unity. It must be hard work. We must overcome the division that was sown from the beginning. It has persisted till now. We have Africans who meet outside and they prepare, they prefer to associate with the whites than with the Africans. Yes, there are challenges in all that, but we must look beyond that and see that our unity, wherever we are, will stand a big step towards building the people and nations of Africa. Number fifth advice, uh, uh, lesson. The educated elite at that time had great opportunities, but that did not trickle down enough. Yes, there were the European resistance and opposition, but a lot more depended on their own resolve and their own efforts, which was lacking. Everyone who is educated, who has privileges in life, must begin to feel the responsibility upon their shoulders that you are not there for your own self. But wherever you are in life, you must, by all means, look 
to the interest of your brother your your sister african out there who needs it therefore every contribution in effort in ideas in looking for somebody to support or help must happen the educated elite have a greater responsibility number six when we did not recognize our resources as africans and we did not appreciate and did not develop ways to 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 bring the value to them the europeans found it and they developed it therefore the lesson is that we must recognize our own assets work assiduously work tirelessly to develop it ourselves without this there's no way our resources will benefit us. Up to today, we have the challenge that we are not able to use our own resources because we do not have the capacity. Capacity building must be enforced and we must focus resources to help our people to transform our resources into valuable product services that will bless the people and bring them to the next phase of advancement and the seventh and the last lesson is that and i would say more or less it is a summary as well the challenges of africa has been very common you will notice sharply that it is not one part that suffered brutalities over another it is not one part that really lost their resources being exported and the others did not it is not only one part that had a kind of a union of nations that is not what the people would have wanted to have the challenges of africa is actually extremely common all throughout all throughout the parts of the land it doesn't necessarily make us one people as somebody say or as so many people so many people say and we do not have necessarily have to behave like we are one family but we must be one in our way of dealing with it we must agree we must learn to agree in agreement or in disagreement because it is essential to deal with the same problems in a coordinated way that gives us time in terms of quick advancement that gives us scale and therefore we must work together so initiatives like the africa trade agreement intercontinental trade agreement that has been enforced all over the, 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 the nations is very good. We must collaborate a lot more because the challenges are one. Collaboration is essential. And this collaboration would not necessarily be to reverse the trend as many people passionately seek to reverse the trend and to you know take back all the lost things some we could but many we cannot our blessing our potential lies in our ability to work together to find a new solution to find a new way of getting ahead in life it must be forward looking not backward looking the lessons must be learned but the lessons must help us go ahead we cannot look back we must go forward regardless of the circles regardless of the straight lines the modern day state of africa has been shaped up in a way that did not benefit the people but we have every opportunity today to make the needed adjustment for our today and our future tomorrow. And I believe that with this understanding, you would 
in your own privacy take up the challenge at your workplace show forth your best in your family decide to be a blessing to them wherever you are and even collectively join us connect with us don't not just to subscribe on youtube but get in touch write us a message we have a lot of projects we need you we need everybody and we'll work together because it is possible it is possible and i am thankful that we have shared this time together we bless god and look forward next week to interacting further with you have a lovely time and a wonderful day god bless you and africa be blessed <laughs>